Wow. Well, was that incredible or what? That was beautiful. I am so proud and so thankful for all the work that went into making this morning possible for us to even gather here and, uh, and to be as beautiful as it's been. Um, everything has just been, I don't know, just beautiful. Um, well, good morning and a very Merry Christmas Eve to you guys. I just have one question before we get started. Is anybody here excited about Christmas? Yes. All right. Well, can we raise a shout for the true reason for the season? Just one time, can we raise a shout for Jesus Christ? Because, hey, I want this morning to be a celebration. Because of all the things in existence and all the things in our lives um, that we celebrate, there is nothing that should make us more excited or more grateful than what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, I'm excited to be with you, and I am excited to be in the house of the Lord. I want to welcome those of you who are visiting. Uh, We are thrilled that you're here. Uh, Whether you go to church every week or this is your first time, you are in the house of the Lord on Christmas Eve, and that is wonderful. Christ stands with open arms ready to receive you, and so do we. You are welcome here. Well, there's a song we sang earlier, and it just happens to be the most recorded song in the history of the world. And that is not entirely surprising because it also happens to be about the uh, most important event in the history of the world. Amazingly, the desperation and humble circumstances out of which that song came about both mirror and can only be outdone by the very silent night that the words in the song depict. Because on Christmas Eve 1818, a blizzard stranded a tiny village in the Austrian mountains. And the extreme cold left the organ of the church broken, and so the church was not able to worship on Christmas Eve. Joseph Moore, who was a young priest at the time, he'd been planning the event for months, and he was desperate that worship would go on, and so he frantically struggled with that organ for hours. And yet for all his efforts, the organ remained silent. Not knowing what to do, the priest turned to God in prayer. He pleaded for any hope of inspiration. And God brought to his mind a poem that he'd begun writing two years earlier about a winter's walk that he'd taken. So he sprinted home. He retrieved that poem. He frantically worked to adapt it to the Christmas story. And then that same evening, he ran the completed poem over to the church organist. And he explained that nothing could be done to fix the organ. And he pleaded with him to compose a musical arrangement that was simple enough to be sung by the church's little choir. And then at midnight, that little choir, they stood in front of the altar of the little church in Ogledorf, and for the first time, the opening notes of that simple little song, Still Knocked, or Silent Night, that had been pulled together in only a matter of a few hours, it pierced the dead silence of the Austrian Alps, and the pure, clear tones echoed through the hills, and the world has been captivated by the beauty of Silent Night ever since. They sang, silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin, mother and child, holy infant so tender and mild, sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in heavenly peace. And in this story, we see that a time of worry and strain and desperation, it actually pressed on God's instruments, the priest and the organist and the choir, and it pushed them past their comfort. It knocked away all the excesses that seemed necessary, like instrumentation and elaborate preparation. And we see that these things were actually drowning out the sweet simplicity that would bring forth this most beautiful song for God's glory. And in all of this, we see that God used the trouble for good. A little strain, a little silence, it may have been stressful at the time, but in the end, we see God is working all things for the good of those who love him. And he uses the silence and the hardship to bring forth incredible beauty. And this reminds us of the story of that first silent night, the event the song is about, when the world had fallen into utter darkness, when all melodies of hope had fallen completely silent, and all of man's efforts to mend our desperate condition had failed. And in the most simple of circumstances, in the most subtle of ways, stripped of any pomp, stripped of even the most basic comforts, the light of hope 
Jesus Christ pierced the darkness, and the song of peace rang out through the silence, and the Savior of the world, Emmanuel, God with us, was born. As Luke opens his gospel, he says, Many eyewitnesses and servants of the word Jesus Christ have undertaken to compile an account of the things that have been fulfilled in his coming. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Luke says, It seems good to me that we should retrace the account of those events, the events of the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And John wrote, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things were made through him, and without him nothing was created that had been made. In the beginning was the Trinity from eternity, God, the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Son. And Jesus, he was the Word and the light. In Christ was life, and the life was the light of mankind. And by the sovereign plan of the Father, the willing agreement and obedience of the Son, and the incarnational work of the Holy Spirit, the light was born into flesh. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth. Nazareth is a tiny little outpost in a rural region of a lowly land called Israel. And aside from the Old Testament prophecies, this town is of such little notoriety and esteem that ten years later, when one of the disciples meets Jesus for the first time, he asks if anything good could ever come out of Nazareth. But in Nazareth, there was a virgin who was engaged to a man named Joseph, who was from the lineage of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And she too was from the ancestry of King David, the lineage from which the scripture prophesied the Messiah was to come. And the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But Mary was terrified and troubled by this because Mary was a normal person like you and I. And angels don't just appear to people. Not even a prophet had heard from God for 400 years. And a visitation from an angel is not a typical occurrence. When we read the Bible, sometimes we tend to think, oh, you know, uh, back in biblical times, these miracles and supernatural things, they just happen all the time. Or maybe we tend to doubt these things because we don't experience them ourselves. But these things have always been extremely rare. You have to recognize that the Bible was written by 40 authors, over the course of 1,500 years, and it recounts highlights of God's supernatural work from several thousand years of history. So even in the thousands of years the Bible covers, the amount of people the Bible records having had encounters with angels is minutely small. So you can expect this was incredibly startling to Mary. And most of us have experienced times like Mary when we have been shaken in our walk with God when we've been startled or surprised by what the Lord is doing in our life. But this doesn't change God's love for us, and it doesn't shake his love for Mary. Because we know that Mary was a devout child of God. The angel says she was highly favored by God. She wasn't perfect. Christ is the only perfect human ever. But to be highly favored by God, it means she was faithful. She trusted God. She was devoted to him. She was humble and worshipful, and God favored her. And therefore, we know Mary was very aware of the holiness and the power of God. And in her reverent fear of God, she has a respectful concern for why God has sent an angel to her. She's worried. And so the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary. Don't be afraid, for you have found favor with God. And he says, Behold, you'll become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you'll name him Jesus, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And Mary, being a virgin, she asked, How will this be? And the angel said, Mary, nothing is impossible with God. The Spirit will come over you, and the child will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. And Mary said, Yes. I am a servant of the Lord. Let this happen to me according to your word. And Mary knew she'd been chosen for something incredible and rare. 400 years of silence from God, and an angel appears to her and says, The child you bear within you will be the Son of God. This is incredible. 
of course, no one would believe her. And she knew this, and she was greatly troubled. And it would be 30 years before uh, any signs of this child's divine identity would be on display. And because of this, Mary faced rejection and ridicule and scorn. Because what she knew to be happening was impossible. But nothing is impossible with God. We see that sometimes God's favor and our faithfulness to God, it causes friction with the world and with our flesh. It creates turmoil with family and friends and people around us who don't understand. And it might go against what we'd rather do, but we trust God. We trust. We trust what we know to be true, and we pursue the will of God, and that's what Mary did. And one of these people who didn't understand was the man Mary was engaged to wed, Joseph. And Joseph was a righteous and good man. Joseph didn't want to bring shame to Mary, but she was pregnant with a child that was not his. And so he decided to divorce her privately. But an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. The child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And both Mary and Joseph, being visited by angels, being told to name the child Jesus, which means Yahweh saves, and being told that he'll be called the Son of God and he'll save the people from their sins, they knew this was all beyond their ability to fully comprehend. But they knew this child was incredibly special and that this was the will of God. And imagining the challenges that would come with raising the Son of God, the unbelief and ridicule they'd face, the alienation from family and friends and neighbors who couldn't possibly understand or believe that Mary was a virgin. The daily uncertainty of what this all meant for their future. The fact that even the best care they could ever give this child would never truly be worthy of the love owed to the Son of God. Joseph and Mary, they commit themselves wholeheartedly to God's will. They set aside whatever other plans or hopes they may have had, and they embrace God's will. They trust, and they step forward in faith. And again, we see that sometimes God's calling on our lives, faithfulness to his good plan, it can be challenging. Even when God is doing a glorious and miraculous work through people that he highly favors, it's not always easy but it's always good. And God gives the strength. And so Augustus was Caesar of Rome at the time, and he called for the registration of all people for tax purposes. Everyone was to return to their hometown. And so Joseph and his pregnant wife, on foot, maybe with the help of a donkey, they traveled 90 miles south and uphill to the city of David called Bethlehem. It's a tiny suburb of Jerusalem. And while they were there, the time came for the Christ child to be born. It was time for the true light who gives light to everyone to come into the world. And Mary gave birth in an animal stable. And she wrapped the baby in a swaddling cloth. And she laid him there in a manger because there was no room in the inn. There was no room anywhere in town for the Son of God. He had no great reception, not even a modest welcome, no room. No crib for a bed, nothing. The world denied him room. As it was written, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. And Billy Graham said over 60 years ago on Christmas 1953, he said, ladies and gentlemen, there is still no room for Jesus Christ. And if Billy Graham said there wasn't room for Christ in 1953, we can hardly imagine there being more room for him now. But praise be to God. God is not thwarted by our resistance. He wasn't then, and he isn't now. And God, in his sovereignty, he makes a way. He works his divine will. And so Mary and Joseph and the newborn king, they weren't received in Bethlehem. But there were lowly shepherds living nearby in the field. They were tending their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and there was a holy light. And the shepherds were terrified upon seeing it. 
But the angel said to them, don't be afraid. Listen, for I proclaim good news that brings great joy to all people. Today your Savior is born in the city of David. He is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign. You will find a baby wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. And the angel says to the shepherds, this is your Savior. These shepherds are not special. They're among the lowest of Israel's social order. They have one of the least desirable jobs in all Israel. They sleep in the field with animals. And it's interesting, the angel doesn't appear to the religious leaders in the temple. And those same religious leaders would later turn Jesus over to be crucified. And the angel doesn't appear to the king, King Herod, who would later slaughter all the babies of Bethlehem in an attempt to kill the child King Jesus. But the angel appears to these lowly, humble shepherds in the wilderness. They will receive the Son of God. And the angel proclaims the Savior is for them. Their people of the world is disregarded, but they've been made open to receiving God. In being removed from the world, all of the noise and distraction has been stripped away, and their hearts are open. And these are the people to whom God will reveal his Son. The meek, the poor in spirit, those who hunger and thirst for God. And God shows he doesn't esteem the things man esteems. God loves the humble and the meek and the poor. And God is for the lonely and the broken and the down and out and the disregarded. And there's a good word here for you and for me. We live in the most distracted generation in history. We are bombarded with updates and notifications and media, and we're consumed and concerned with people's likes. And God shows he has a huge heart for the disregarded. And if this is you, if this is a tough time for you, if you feel like people are too caught up in their own lives and in their celebrating this Christmas to notice you, if you feel like you've been disregarded, or if you're just struggling to get through Christmas, know that God draws near to the broken and the disregarded. God loves all people, not just the popular and put together people. And Christ came for all people. This is the Savior of both the shepherds and the magi, the wise men who came from the east looking for the newborn king. Shepherds or kings, it doesn't matter. What matters is when they heard the call of God, they believed and they went to worship the Christ. And if you're in a lowly place this Christmas, then you are in the right place. Because God's not calling us to justify our personal weaknesses or to just pick ourselves up and scrape by. And he's not calling us to hide our flaws or to wear a mask and act as if everything's okay. No, He's calling us to draw near to Christ and be healed. That's why he's come. That's who he receives, those who know they need him. And the angel tells these shepherds to go and see this young girl from nowhere. At the time, she's a nobody. She's resting in a stable in a tiny outpost town. She has a baby wrapped in cloth, sleeping in a manger, which is just a wooden trough for feeding animals. And the shepherds ran. And they located Mary and Joseph, and they found the baby lying in a manger, and they glorified and praised God for all they had heard and seen, excuse me, and seen, as everything was just as the angel had said. And then eight days later, Mary and Joseph went up to the temple to dedicate the baby, and he was circumcised, and they named him Jesus. And in the temple, there was an old man named Simeon, who had been looking for the coming of the Messiah. And when the parents brought in Jesus, Simeon recognized him, and he took him in his arms, and he praised God, saying, My eyes have seen the Lord's salvation, for the light, for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to God's people, Israel. Simeon witnessed in the baby boy, Jesus Christ, this was the light of hope come to pierce the darkness. The light of the world, and whoever follows him will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And to all who receive Jesus who believe in his name, he grants the right to become children of God. For the Father granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those the Father has given to him. And this is eternal life, that you know God, the one true God, 
and Jesus Christ, whom the Father sent. And when the light of hope pierces the darkness, the darkness scatters and flees in all directions. God's word says the light pierces the heart and reveals the soul. And when encountered by the light, some will hate it. Some will flee. Others will be overwhelmed and undone. And we'll fall to our knees and we will worship him. And this is why we celebrate. Why our families gather together and exchange gifts. And why we put lights on our house. We cut down pine trees and place them in our homes. And we gather together around to decorate with lights because Jesus Christ is the eternal God. And in him, the light of eternal life has entered the world. There are traditions of people using pine trees to represent all kinds of things for many years. But Christians have used the evergreen to represent eternal life since the 7th century. Because the evergreen tree survives the darkest and bleakest and harshest days of winter. And just as the world sat in its darkest hour, in distant cold silence, and when all looked as though it was lost, God sent the light of eternal life into the world. And legend has it that when Martin Luther was walking home through the snow on a dark 16th century December evening, he became so captivated by the starlight that was twinkling in the branches of a tree that he chopped it down and he dragged it into the house. And he placed it in his home and he put candles in it to mimic that twinkling light, that light of hope. Luther said that for him, the tree represented the everlasting love of God. The tree's color didn't fade just as, didn't fade just as the love of God never fades. No matter what the circumstances or the trial, God's love persists. In the bleakest winter, the evergreen still thrives. And Luther tied wooden candle holders to the branches to hang the light of Christ in the tree, the light of hope, which is hope for reconciliation to God and peace between men and life everlasting. And 33 years after that first silent night, when the light of hope uh, experienced a very different silent night and he uh, there came another different silent night and it was a beautiful scandalous night as the song says because the light fell silent when he was crucified and having died for the sins of the world to reconcile sinners to God and to extend the offer of forgiveness and eternal life to all those who would place their faith in him he was taken down off that other tree the cross and he was placed in a tomb but after the crucifixion, after falling silent for three days, Christ rose again the third day to conquer death. And the light of eternal life again shined forth. And the message of the gospel rang out to take the offer of salvation to the entire world. And at Christmas, the true light who gives life to everyone came into the world. And to all who've received him, those who believe in his name, he's given the right to become children of God. The light has broken forth in the world. A star has risen from Israel. The star of the morning, the light of the world, the rod of the nations. Even the fact that we hang lights at Christmas time, as fun and beautiful as it is, it all began because in this baby, the light entered the world. His work of redeeming his people and bringing an end to darkness and sin and evil and misery, it began right there on that very first Christmas. When a young virgin and her faithful husband, they sat in an animal shelter and they swaddled endless hope and relentless joy come to earth as a baby. When the good news of God's message of hope and peace broke the silence on that very first silent night. Silent night, holy night, son of God, love's pure light, radiant beams from thy holy face with the dawn of redeeming grace, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. So at this time, I'm going to ask John to come up here. I'm going to ask him to lead us in one last verse of Silent Night. And I'm going to ask you guys to respond to what God has done in Christ by singing out to him from the bottom of your heart. And when we're done, I'll pray for us, and then we'll dismiss. Silent Night is a simple, peaceful song. But it pierced the silence in a powerful way and became the most recorded song ever. Christ, the light of the world, has entered as a helpless babe in the most humble circumstances and become the most impactful person ever to walk the earth. 
Christ is the most followed, written about, painted, talked about, sung about person ever, as the Son of God should be. And the Christmas story, it should give us comfort that God works in counterintuitive ways. He doesn't always do things the way that you and I might choose to do them. Because his ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts higher than our thoughts. God brings light out of darkness. He brings beauty out of ugliness. He brings melody out of silence, and in Christ, he brings life out of death. And if you're in a low spot this Christmas, if you're just limping through this holiday season, if you feel lost, like you're stumbling around in darkness, if you feel like God is distant and you've been suffocating in the silence, know that God is present in the silence. God is not, not a God of apathy, nor a God of fear. God enters into difficult situations and darkness. And sometimes silence is really just his preparation to bring about something glorious and beautiful. And in Christmas, we celebrate that God is a God of love, of peace, of precision and wisdom, and of perfectly measured power. And in the birth of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, God broke the silence, leaving the perfect confines of heaven to enter our fallen world and pierce the darkness to bring love and forgiveness and redemption by becoming our Emmanuel, God with us. Praise God. His Son be glorified forever. Let's sing our praise for that first silent night. We pray that you'd grant us faith to believe that when the prophets fall silent or the organ fails to play, it's by your sovereign purpose to draw something beautiful out of the silence. Attune our ears that we may be prepared to more clearly hear your voice when you speak. Open our eyes that we may see your light in the world all around us. Lead us to lean into one another so that we never walk in darkness alone. And use the Christmas story 
to help us always remember that your silence is not your absence, but your preparation for something greater. Lord, by your spirit, work through us. Empower us to be the light of Christ to our watching family members, friends, and neighbors as we go from here to celebrate Christmas. And from the depths of our hearts to the depths of the heavens, our hearts well with gratitude for your coming. Your name be praised forever. Emmanuel, the Prince of Peace and the Light of Life. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, we love you. We celebrate you, Lord. It's by the power of your Spirit and in the matchless authority of your Son, Jesus Christ, to you, Father, we pray. Amen.